and, and didn't say anything. It was a weird vibe in the room. You could, fear, you could hear a pin drop. And he finally says to us, you people think you're so damn hot. Here you are, MBAs. That you're going to go out there and make it happen. And everybody can't wait to see you because you know so much. And he said, you know shit. You haven't done anything. And I lean over to Barry and I say, what an asshole this guy is. So uh, the next guest, most of you know from a show called Shark Tank. He's been on the show since 2008. He's not just great on the show, he's wonderful. He's the co-founder of The Learning Company, which was later acquired by Mattel. He is the co-host for Discovery Channel's Discovery Project Earth. He's the founder of O'Shares ETF Investments, O'Leary Ventures, O'Leary Mortgages, O'Leary Books, and O'Leary Fine Wines. I've seen him. I know he's a watch collector. Uh, I know he likes to play guitar. He just got a brand new guitar. I think it was called a Martin guitar, if I, if I remember. Uh, but super excited to have none other than Mr. Wonderful, Kevin O'Leary. Give it up! to see real people. Yeah, this is fantastic. What a great energy you got in here. Great to have you here. Everybody's a fan, right? Thank you, thank you. You know, you're probably my favorite shark. I mean, you are, your style is just much, much more <laughs> truthful, honest. Like, dude, there's no business here. There's no cash flow. I'm out of here. So I like that. How many of you like him as the favorite? Thank you, thank you. You know, I, I think in business, um, it's not like many other things because there's no gray zone. Either you make money or you lose money. Uh -huh. Pick one. And I know which side I want to be on. That's, that's the way I look at it. That's the way so, I so, treat it. So, everybody. Kevin, how important is money to a business? Because these most, how many business owners here? Okay. And how many of you work for a business? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So, so talk, talk about money being important and talking about as it, though it's important. The way I look at it is the reason that people pursue entrepreneurship is not about the greed of money. It's about the pursuit of personal freedom. Everybody in this room wants to be successful. And in entrepreneurship, the way to define success is you make money. And then eventually there comes a time in your life when you wake up and you say, shit, I'm rich. I never saw it coming. Yeah. And I could do whatever I want. And most of the time what people do is work even harder because they like what they do. That's what entrepreneurship's about. It's setting yourself free to, to spend your time, your day in the things that you want to do. And the great part about it is nobody can tell you what that is. It's only you. Yeah, yeah. That's the whole yeah. deal right there. What was your first score? My, big, my first um, business was actually a television production company called Special Event Television that made all the intermissions for the hockey games in the original six teams, Detroit, New York, Boston, Philadelphia. And we used to run around shooting hockey players uh, during the week, and then we'd send it up to the satellite for the games on Saturday nights. And uh, that business was really successful, and I sold it, and I realized, wow, this is great. So you start a company and then you sell it. Why don't I do that again? Uh -huh. And that's what would you sell that company for? Oh, it wasn't that much. I think we started it, you know, with uh, $10,000 I borrowed from my mother and I had to pay her back, of course. And, and the, and then what we sold, it was something like 4 million and there was only three of us. But at that time, that's the first time I ever had any money at all. And I just plowed that into the next deal and the next deal and the next deal. And then one day 
um, you know, we, we started the learning company. It was called SoftKey in the beginning. And we sold that one for $4 billion. I remember the day that happened. For, for what? $4.2 billion. Billion. And yeah, it was... But I, but I have to tell you guys something. That I, I'll never forget the day, you know, every, there was 10 founders in that company. And we'd all been together since the garage. And the next morning, we were in Boston, and the lawyers came over, and we closed the deal, and we signed it. And I looked at everybody and said, what do you want to do? I mean, we're all stinking rich. What do you want to do? And they said, why don't we just go back to work? We don't know anything else. And that's exactly what happened. So, so how, how, old were, how long ago was that? How old were you? Well, with? that was back, you know, 20 years ago. And, and I've, since then, I've had some great successes and some catastrophic failures. That's the nature of entrepreneurship. You just don't know. But back then, I was an operator. I actually, you know, operated the business. I don't do that anymore. I'm an investor. And I like to think that I can provide, you know, guidance to my CEOs about the things not to do because I've made plenty of mistakes, and I think that's what experience is. You really kind of want to make it the path of least resistance because not all businesses are going to work. I know that. And so, you know, I'll try a great idea, but what the difference is, and you know this, executional skills. There's a million great ideas out there, but the ability to execute on it and do it, really hard. So, so what, ha what is the differentiator between the, the person that can execute and the person that doesn't pull it off? Because I know you just had this experience with the right. 54 countries through COVID, but who's the, how, do you, how can you look out in that audience and say, hey, who here can execute and who is just an idea and it will never happen? Well, let me give you some data which you may find interesting because I've been doing this for almost 20 years now. The majority of the money I've made in companies that I was part of founding and then were operated by another CEO, the majority has come from companies run by women. Now, like, I'm not trying to start gender warfare here. I'd give money to a goat if I could get a return. I don't care. But you have to ask yourself, what are they doing that is making these outcomes? And remember, these are multiple sectors. I'm talking about insecticide companies, gym equipment companies, commercial kitchens. We have a wireless charging company. I mean, they're all different. And yet the outcomes, women are better. Why? So we did some research. We said, we've got to figure this out because why don't we find out what the great companies are doing and share it with our portfolio companies aren't doing so well. And what we discovered was, rather interestingly, if you look at uh, women-run companies and you look at because we have all the data. What did they forecast for sales in a quarter? What did they achieve? And then look at the ones run by men. In the case of women, they achieve their goals quarterly 90% of the time, okay? 90. In the case of ones run by men, 65% of the time. Wow. But the men had sales targets 30% higher. So they were really doing what I call the testosterone stretch, really saying, let's, let's go for it, and only hitting it 65% of the time. Now, why would that manifest itself in a difference in cash flow? You got to ask that question, right? Here's why. In a company where the whole team consistently hits goals, the culture becomes very sticky, and nobody wants to leave. There's no staff turnover. There's no disruption in revenue. There's no disruption in accounting, compliance. The team is stuck together. And the ones where you, they only hit their target 65% of the time, there's a lot of unhappiness and angst, particularly in the sales force. And their staff turnover is much higher. So when we put this new policy in place, you set targets that you hit. We did this three years ago now with all the companies. I don't care if there's no growth in your target, but if you hit the target, we started to save lower turnover. And now in the companies that were not doing well, cash flow is up 18%. That's something you should, if it's the only thing you remember today when I'm talking about, set goals you can achieve and watch things happen. Because people want to work in a winning, it's like playing for Brady. Nobody wants to leave the team. Yeah. The guy just keeps winning Super Bowls. That's it. So, so the cash flow, is that just another winning indicator for you? Because I hear you talk a lot about cash flow, and I know it's really important to me. So um, why, and why is it important for the audience to measure it? Let me be clear about cash flow. It's the only thing I care about, okay? Because there is no bit, there is no business without cash flow. You might be able to last for a couple of years borrowing money, getting more investors, but if you don't have cash flow, you're going to zero. 
It's that simple. And I think you have to face that reality as an entrepreneur. Cash flow is the blood of business. If you don't have any blood, you're dead. So you might as well look at it that way, respect it for what it is, realize that's the only way. And people say, oh, that's not true. What about this? What about that? And I say, whatever you're talking about is irrelevant if you don't have cash flow. Yeah, so, so you're, then how, how does Bitcoin relate to that conversation? So Bitcoin, I mean, look, I was not a Bitcoin guy till yeah. very recently. I bought some in 2017, but the regulator was not, and I'm in many companies that are regulated. You know, I've got an ETF business, I have a lot of fintech businesses, and the regulator was very much against even talking about Bitcoin on TV. As soon as the regulators opened up in Canada and Switzerland, Australia, England, they even have ETFs in Canada, and they're about to get them in Switzerland now, too. Three, three, I th the five. Third one. There's oh, gonna five. Be, there's two more just got filed today. So it's only a matter of time before. Um, I'll tell you a really interesting story about this, because I only came out three weeks ago, and I said, look, I've bought a 3% weighting in Bitcoin. I'd already had a bunch, 3%, 3%. So I have a rule about investing. I never let a single stock become more than 5% of my portfolio. I never let a sector like energy or technology become more than 20%. This includes real estate. I once had real estate up to 31% of my portfolio because I love real estate. Obviously, it's going through some changes on the commercial side, but not residential. But my point was when I disclosed that I'd gone to 3% Bitcoin, I'd never anticipated this would happen. All the companies we invest in, are sustainable companies. In other words, we believe in a zero carbon footprint. We think people care about that. That's why in all of our companies, that's what we do. And my staff in my operating companies and in my own holding company are all of that ilk, of that age where they give a shit, they care. The first thing I started to get were hundreds of phone calls from people, you know, investors of mine, companies that my CEO saying, these coins you own, were they mined in China? I don't know. Were they mined in a way that wasted electricity? I don't know. And all of a sudden, I thought I was saying to myself, I better get to know, because people care about that on Bitcoin. And so now my new thing is I'm starting to invest or buy miners myself, and I'm going to just take that virgin coin, and that's the only coin I'm going to own. Is it sustainable? Is it mined in a country that doesn't have sanctions on it or abuses human beings like China does? This is the new thing coming, Grant, on, on Bitcoin. You, you sound much more loving than, than I'm used to. I'm kumbaya, baby. <laughs> like I'm getting this humanity. I'm totally kumbaya because, because I've learned the customers that way. It's not a marketing scam anymore. If you're not sustainable, if you don't adhere to what customers want as a consumer, like one of my companies is called Blue Land. It's trying to get rid of 50 million plastic bottles where cleaning fluids put in. And they crystallize the cleaning fluid and you use a reusable glass bottle. And they ship it to you and it's a crystal. So you get your detergent, whatever it is, crystallized. That thing started, it was a Shark Tank deal last year, zero sales. It's doing 80 million a year now. Wow. That tells you customers give a shit. Yeah. So. How important with what we just printed in cash? I think 21% of all the U.S. dollars were printed last year. Looks like they're going to load up on another level. How important are real assets going forward? Well, they're real important. I mean, you know, I, I think you got to start thinking about things like real estate. There's a reason Miami real estate is up 40% in the last 18 months or something, because it's a hard asset. Did you mention real estate? <laughs> I own plenty, don't worry. But I've, I've trimmed back a bit on, on office commercial. I'm waiting to see how that works out, getting more into the residential side. You know, that's a good revenue. You know, I don't have to tell you this. Yeah. Like, you're the guy. Are you talking about apartments? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> this guy owns every apartment in the Miami. Like, he's the landlord, basically. No, listen, you've, you have to have had a fantastic mark-to-market run on your real estate. It's got to be amazing. It's been just ridiculous. Yeah. And then what, what happens now with everybody coming down here in the residential, the home price is going up 40%. It's just going to push yeah. into renters. I'm one of those guys. I've been living in a condo. My wife is shopping for a home. She comes back with sticker prices that I want to throw up on my shoes. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. the stuff is insane. Yeah. It's crazy, but that's the, that's the market. And, and do you think that continues? Yeah, I do. I'll tell you why. We're, we're, we're going to print 
$1.9 trillion. We're going to put it in a helicopter, and we're going to just shower it down on the people. Now, you can, you can decide if that's good or bad, but that's happening as we speak. They just signed it into law in the last 48 hours. So that's inflationary. It will be. There's no question. So, so where does that inflation show up? Is it going to show up in job salaries? No, it it's, first, it's first going to show up in financial instruments. You're going to see the 10-year probably go to 2% before the end of the year. That in itself is not catastrophic, but it will cause some volatility in the markets. Um, it'll continue to accelerate home prices because people would rather own a hard asset than cash when it's being printed. I mean, it's not like we're... Okay, so, so when that happens, when the Treasury goes up and then when house, housing prices go up, that means fewer people can actually buy well, that house because their salaries, you didn't mention yeah, salaries yet, so... The, 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 the 10-year doesn't affect real estate till it gets past 3%. I don't think that's happening anytime soon. So you've got a ways to go before that occurs. It doesn't even affect stock prices till it goes back. You have to think of it, when does it come competitive? When do you make a decision, I'd rather own a treasury than a stock? That's around 3%. That's when it starts to happen. So we've got, a, we've got some time to go here. But there's no question that, you know, it's going to be a different kind of market. It's going to be a little more volatile. Um, you've got the whole Bitcoin phenomenon. You saw a piece of digital art sell last night for $60 million. Crazy. The guy that made it, you know, he just, I can't even repeat what he said. He couldn't believe it. And this is just something he made on a computer that somebody paid $60 million for. That's because that person thought this digital code is worth more than the worthless dollars being printed. Yes. So I'd rather own that. So do you understand the NFT? I don't, I don't understand what it is. What it is is a, uh, an, an image that he basically made over 4,000 days of in the pictures of himself and other things, and he stitched together in the cloud on the blockchain. And the reason that matters is there can only be one of these images. You can't copy it. It's, mm -hmm. it's locked and loaded. And what's amazing about it, if the guy that bought it sells it again... Because it's on the blockchain, he gets a royalty because he's the original creator. So this is going to happen in music too. Blockchain changes everything. When you write a song and you get ripped off, it can't happen again. Because when you sample the song, the blockchain goes with it and they automatically pay you the royalty. It's amazing what's going on. So you think the artist then will go more the, the digital way? I th because he'll get, he'll get paid every time it trades. Look, you could have bought a Picasso, but instead you bought this. Uh -huh. Think about that. That's pretty crazy. I mean, look, it is what it is. It, it was a real trade. It was a real U.S. dollar trade. Everybody bidding was under 40 years old, um, and they were all big Bitcoin guys. If you, you know, if you have 60 million bucks, it's because you bought a ton of Bitcoin eight years ago. Would you tell somebody that's done that, though, like, let's say somebody was in Bitcoin at 500 bucks? And they're sitting at 57000 a day. Yeah. When does a guy get off that train? Here's the decision you got to make. And I'll, I, I, this is advice that's served me well, and my mother taught me this. Because let, let me tell you an equivalent story. A few years ago, my son, who's, who was an electrical engineer, was interning at Tesla. And I was, I, I was about to go on to halftime report on CNBC. And um, Tesla was downgraded that day. Before all the splits, it was trading at $236. And Trevor said to me, Dad, why don't you own some Tesla? I work there as an intern. And I said, I want to short that stock. It's such a joke. It's a car company trading at a ridiculous price. He said, no, you're the joke. You don't understand what Tesla does. I work there. It's not a car company. It's a data company. Every time a car drives a mile, it goes back to the server and it tells the resolution of that road gets better and better and better because every mile a Tesla drives, it goes into the database of mapping for autonomous cars. And I thought, shit, I didn't know that. He said, no kidding. Like, you, you have a ton of money. Why don't you buy some of this stock? Because I don't have any money. So just before I went on the air, I took my phone out and I bought a whack of the stock in my personal account, not our ETFs. I just bought it. Then I forgot about it. <laughs> One day I opened up the thing and I was up like a thousand percent, but it was way more than 5% of that portfolio. So I started selling it and selling it. It kept going up and I kept selling it and selling it. So you're selling enough to get back down to 5%. I'm, yeah, I mean, it only re recently corrected. So I bought it back up to 5%, but my cost base is zero. Uh -huh. It doesn't matter what happens to Tesla now. I made a ton of money on it. That's the trick with Bitcoin. 
You keep it at whatever you decide. I like 5%. Right now I'm at 3 If it goes past that, I sell it down. I, and my mother taught me this game. She said, this way you never cry the blues. You always have cash flow. That's it. You can't go broke if you have cash. So, biggest mistake you've ever made? Is there a big one that stands out? Yeah, like, I've made a few. Shake it. I remember once, I'll never forget this one. It breaks my heart. It, it, it hurts me now just to think about it. You know, because I, I, I cry like a baby when I lose money. But the, a friend of mine started a company. I gave him $250,000, and he had a forecast. It was a real startup, and I felt, great, I'll do it. I wasn't 100% into it, but he was a friend. It's mistake number one. Mistake number two was 60 days later, he comes back and says, look, I need another 500000 to make this work. And my gut told me right then, don't do this. Do not do this. It doesn't feel right. Maybe you have some stress with your friend, but 500000 is a lot of money. Anyways, I didn't listen to my intuition. I gave him the five hundred k. He went to zero 90 days later. That's $750,000. Please, a moment of silence for that money. Because I, I killed it. I killed that money. I killed it. Yeah. And I'll never, ever, ever do that again. So I don't let emotion get in the way. You see it on Shark Tank all the time. I don't care about your feelings. I care about your money. You know, if you're going to cry, you think I'm bad. Wait till the real world gets a hold of you. It'll rip you to pieces. I mean, that's, that's the way I look at it. The, what would be the best advice when somebody comes on Shark Tank, when they're walking through there like... Do you know, I mean, I know a lot of that's, you guys have some time. It is TV, right? Yeah. But if, if they were really coming here to pitch you right now, what, is there one or two pieces of advice? I'll give you some good advice on this one. First of all, I'm going to tell you something really strange that's happened to me. I've been doing this for 15 years. When they come out and they have that moment where they're sitting on the carpet, I'm right in front of them. Like, they're right in front of me. And... They can't say anything because there's a guy with a steady cam, which is a camera that goes around them, and that's that opening shot. And that takes about two minutes. You don't see any more than 10 seconds of it. But they can't say anything, and the floor director saying, don't say anything, don't move. And the guy with the steady cam's going around, and they're just nervous as hell. And, and I'm right in front of them. So I just look at them. I just look at them. I swear to you, I can tell right then without hearing anything about their product, just looking them in the eye, the way they look back for that, those two minutes, winner, loser. Winner, loser. Just the aura. Just the, I'm not kidding, I'm not kidding. And now I really, because they can't avoid my stare, I'm, I'm the guy right in front of them and I'm just grilling them. I'm never, I may never see What do you them. see, what do you see, do you know? The confidence in their eyes, the ability to take the hit to, 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 to be in that stressful environment, 26 cameras, all those lights, you know, these, these, you know, these entrepreneur sharks looking at them and not to just fold like a leaf falling off a tree, just like almost a pushback vibe. And that is the presence you need as an entrepreneur. You need to project, I'm here to kick ass. I'm here to, I don't care what you ask me, I have an answer for it. And I am ready to do business with you. And you can tell. This is something you should almost practice in front of the mirror. You have to have, you have, to have an aura of confidence. An aura of confidence. And remember, even if you're in doubt, even if you're in doubt, you must project you're not. I am confident. I am ready. Whatever hits me, I'm here for it. That's what I see in the way. Do, do you think that the, the seller in this case, because they're, they're selling yeah. to you, should have a specific target or be open to all five players? You know, that goes to valuation, but I'll tell you an interesting study a British professor did. He convinced Shark Tank is owned by Sony, all right? They have it on in 23 countries. He went to Sony and some of the producers said, would you let me study the unedited tape? Because um, I have a theory that there's a common string between the winners and the losers. And here's what he found, and I totally agree with this. The, the, the deals, so this is something you should remember for whenever you're doing as an entrepreneur. It doesn't matter if you're in Shark Tank. This applies to everybody. Can you articulate the opportunity in 90 seconds or less? 
all of the companies that got funded in all 23 countries, in multiple geographies, in multiple languages, all were able to say, here's my idea in 90 seconds or less. In most cases, less than 60 seconds, you know? Hi, I'm Sarah, I crystallize detergent, and I eliminate the plastic bottle and I ship it to you, to your home, and we don't waste plastic. That's like 17 seconds. I get it. Okay, so that's number one. Number two, it, this takes longer than 90 seconds. What is it about you that married to this great idea can execute? Did you work in that business before? Did you work for a competitor? Has it been in the family? Have you failed before and now you know what you did wrong? So explaining why you are the right individual and team to execute on the idea. Now, when those two come together, you can see it in the unedited tape that all of the, you know, the sharks in every country sit up and they go, oh, I'm, you know, I have a great idea and I have executional skills, so my risk is mitigated. I think I'm interested. But here's the killer, the last one, number three. You have to know your numbers. How big is the market? How fast is it growing? What are the gross margins? What's the break-even analysis? You have to be able to answer those questions. Now, in the case of Shark Tank here stateside, if you don't know your numbers, I will personally put you in hell myself because you, you, you deserve to burn in hell because you've made it, you have made it past 50,000 applications. Only maybe 300 get considered, only 220 tape and 180 air. There you are with your opportunity. You've beat the odds and you don't know your numbers? I mean, of course you so, should go so to So at hell. that point, are you looking at the person more than the idea? Like, like how, how much is it person and how much idea, if there was a ratio? Well, I'd give 70% uh, to the person, uh, 30 to the idea, because I won't invest in uh, hot sauces. There are a million hot sauces. There's always a hot sauce every year. Hi, my, aunt, my this is my family recipe for a hot sauce. Who gives a shit? Like, it, there, there's no way you're ever going to make money trying to break into the hot sauce market when it's already completely saturated. Yeah, so that whole opening thing about, oh, I, my mom's doing this, the whole story at the beginning, you don't care about any of that story, right? That's just no. TV. Do I care what your dog was called in high school? What, you know, that you're on the cheerleading team? I mean, what, what does that have to do with the investment I'm looking at? I mean, that's, that's, that's such just TV a... TV making. No, I know, but it's such right. a waste of time for you. You should be spending your time explaining to me why I'm going to make uh -huh. a ton of money. Uh -huh. That's, uh -huh. that's, you know, I was a cheerleader. That's great. But how do I make money off that? Yeah, yeah. Like... <laughs> yeah. So is that person, that, that personality that, that we see on TV, like, was that developed? There's, was it... This was, is me now, and uh -huh. that's me then, and I yeah. don't change my personality. My mother taught me something really great that I didn't really put a lot of value on early in my career, but it's a very simple thing. Always tell the truth and you'll never have to remember what you said. Right? And, and, and what I, and it's, and it's very hard to do that. Most people want to please others by not telling them the truth, but that kills you in the context of Shark Tank because it makes you go on in a stupid business. I'm the only one that says, your business sucks, it's going to zero, you shouldn't do this, you should come up with a better idea. And then they're crying in front of me. Have you been wrong on any of those where you said, no way, and then they... Grant, they... I'm never wrong. Well, there you go. Shit. What did your mama tell you about hey, never hey, being wrong? I'm just, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Yeah. Listen, at the end of the day, other investors will also choose, and the real market will choose too. But it's, it's very interesting that entrepreneurship, really, you have to be able to take a few hits. You're going to fail. It makes you better makes you stronger, gives you callous. When you play guitar, you want that callous. You want to get that, uh, you know, you need that in business too. And once you're an entrepreneur and you're, 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 you're infected with that bug, you want to stay an entrepreneur. And it doesn't matter if you fail a couple of times. I would much rather invest in someone that's felt the sting of failure anyways. I can't stand the arrogance of somebody who walks in and says, you know, I'm 26 years old, I've never done anything, but give me a valuation of $10 million. What? No. I'll let Barbara do that. So, so you're, you mentioned your mom three times. Yeah. Like, who had the most influence on you, mom or dad? Well, my, my original father died when he was 37. He was an Irish guy, a sales guy. You, and my you mother were how old? What's that? How old were you? I was like six. Okay. Yeah. It was really tough. And my mother remarried, and uh, my stepfather uh, was going to uh, University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana, and I lived in Champaign-Urbana. 
for Botton Field High School. Won't forget it. There is no colder place in February on Earth than Champaign, Illinois, so I can tell you that. I love the place, but I won't be going back there in the winter ever again. But the whole point is, then he took a job with the United Nations, and we started traveling two years, Cambodia, Tunisia, Ethiopia, Cyprus, you know, every two years a different country. And that was a, a huge eye-opener for me, um, because in every country there's expats. There's an American community there, you kind of get to know them. And we just kept moving, and it, it really ended up being quite a ride. Um, and that's sort of, you know, that's, you, you can't, you don't know what makes you uh, learn the things you learn, but that was it for me. Yeah. The, you, I read this article about, you had some, it's the meanie of money. I'm not, the, the, there were some personalities around money, or there was five, you, you know what I'm Yeah, I know to. what you're talking well, about. Tell me about that. I, I thought it was really interesting. Yeah, you know, it, it's... We, we didn't plan any of this, by the way. We had a yeah, no, it's call, five-minute call. Stream of consciousness, which is always the best. The, the, the essence of that is the idea that, you know, I guess the best way to put it is when you form a relationship with a significant other in your life, it's very hard to put it up this way because it's so euphoric when you fall in love. But actually, you're starting a business is what you're doing. And you're, you're starting that business to mitigate your risk for the rest of your life because you're going to build a family. And what I like people to think about is because I, I did a lot of research in this. I've written three books on men, women, and money. The number one reason that people divorce has nothing to do with infidelity. Most marriages can survive infidelity. The reason they, they divorce between five and seven years and 50% of these marriages fail is financial stress. Mm -hmm. and, and what happens is one of the pair does not have the same objectives financially as the other. In other words, maybe they outspend, maybe they, maybe they have huge credit card debts, they don't care. But if you're not in sync with each other about money, it ain't gonna work. And, and that's what I try and talk about. You have to treat it like it's the third person in your marriage. You gotta treat it with the, respect. The money, the money. Yeah, the, the money, person. that's the whole idea of treating it like a vertical you have to deal with. And great marriages that last 30, 40 years, you find that stability. You find that a, a team, because, you know, let's face it, I mean, any, I've been married over 30 years, I love my wife, but it's not the same than when I met her. You know, it's a whole, we've gone through the whole thing together, we've been separated for two years, but we have a family, and I, that's a business. You know, and, and I don't give money to my kids, and they're really pissed at me, but I don't care. They're, they're gonna have to go figure it out for themselves, but I did guarantee them, if they ever have children, I'll pay the full freight from birth to last day of college, because that's what my mother did to me. See, fourth time. Yeah. His mom had a big imprint well, to the it, ladies. It, she hated entitlement. She hated Your entitlement. Mom, yeah. yeah. She couldn't stand rich kids that had their... Because when I graduated, I didn't know she was going to do this to me. She said to me that day from college, she said, listen, Kevin, the dead bird under the nest never learns how to fly. And I said, what? What does that mean? She said, no more checks. And I said, you can't do that. I don't have a job. She said, oh, Yeah. I've paid all the way to this day. You've, been, you, I've, you, you've burned a lot of cash of mine, and now you're on your own. Now go figure it out. And I had a tough couple of years. But when I finally was you know, successful financially, I built a trust that was designed based on her wishes. Birth to last day of college, generational skipping trust, and my kids were four and seven. I went home that day. That was on the learning company exit. I, I basically took half that dough and stuck it in, in that generational skipping trust. And... I went back and said to Trevor and Savannah, and they were four and seven, this is how this trust works. And they went, what? Anyways, many years later, when my son was failing in high school, he came to me one day and said, Dad, you know, uh, one of his friends had a trust. He said, how does my trust work? I said, well, if mom and I go out for dinner tonight and we get run over by a truck, you don't have to worry because it's going to pay for you to finish high school because it doesn't look like you have the marks to get into college, so you don't have to worry about that. <laughs> and he said, okay, what happens after that? I said, well, I'm dead and you have no money because this trust only works until you finish school. And he went, are you kidding? I said, no, it's written in stone. It's run by a bunch of guys that I don't even know. It's, that's the deal. He went, you must be kidding. I said, no, I, I'm not kidding. The dead bird under the nest never learns how to fly, is what I told him. 
And it, was, it must have been the darkness that he felt, the uncertainty, the abyss that he faced. So you want him to go to college? You insist on He it? went downstairs and he cracked the books from that day on. He's now working at Tesla as an, an engineer. He became an, you know, an engineer. I thank my mother for that. That was her idea. How important is, when you look at something, how, how long are you spending to make a decision on it? Is it fast? Yeah, or it's is pretty it fast. a lot of due diligence? It's, I, I have a lot of uh, experience now, and I feel I, I live by that intuition. I'll tell you a story that I'll never forget, and I, and I told, you know, I now guest lecture at places like Harvard and MIT and Temple, Notre Dame. I love doing it. I love doing it. And I always tell them this story because I remember it. I don't, I remember nothing from my MBA. I went, my, my dad said to me, my stepfather said, you are so, all you did is take, you know, classes in art and psychology and you just wanted to hang with girls in university and now you don't know anything, you're going to starve to death. And I went, ah. Oh. He has a point there. So I went, I went to business school for two years, and in the last day, there were 86 people in my class, and to my right, the guy that I'd been sitting beside for two years, Barry was his name. In comes this guest lecture, last day, and it's, he just looks at us, like for about a minute, and, and didn't say anything. It was a weird vibe in the room. You could, fear, you could hear a pin drop, and he finally says to us, you people think you're so damn hot. Here you are, MBAs. That you're going to go out there and make it happen, and everybody can't wait to see you because you know so much. And he said, you know shit. You haven't done anything. And I lean over to Barry and I say, what an asshole this guy is. And he went on to explain that the reason you become valuable in life is you do something. You achieve something and you get experience doing that, but you're worthless until you get that done. It doesn't matter what you learned in school. It matters what you do. That's why many, many successful people never go to college. It doesn't matter. It's really hard to make something work in business. And I thought to myself, this guy's such a dick. Now, fast forward 30 years, that guy is me. I, I, I just said that to a, a to this week I did the, um, virtually, I did it virtually, I gave the speech to the Harvard graduating class and I said the same thing. And I said to them, I hope you guys sitting wherever you are in all these countries are thinking what a dick I am. Because then I've done my job. One third of you are going to fail. You're just not going to make it. Even though you have a hot MBA, who cares? The world's going to chew you up and spit you out. They don't care. And the truth is, I don't remember a single thing about any of what I learned in those two years, except the people like Barry I sat beside. We're now bankers all over the world, so I talk, talk to him all the time. And that guy. That guy taught me an important lesson. It humbled me. So, so when you're looking, like, if, if you were going back through college today, would you be going for the education or would you be going for the connections? Connections. Yeah. You know, that really pisses off. The, they keep inviting me back to guest lecture, and I always say the same thing. You're not going to remember any of this crap. But all the people that are sitting with you, yes. that you worked with for two years, the connections, that's, the, that's the why you do it. Because you're not going to remember shit. So when you're going into a room, Kevin, even today, like, are you looking to make connections with people, this, this audience here? Or yeah. should they be looking for, how do I connect and do business? Or it's, Business is all about connections. Business is all about pe respecting people, trusting people. That's why it's, you know, th this idea of lying to people. I mean, put it in the context of the marriage, like the research I did on divorce when I wrote the first book. When you have a, a relationship of trust in business or in marriage with somebody, and you, it's very powerful because they trust you and, and they're willing to give you the benefit of the doubt. When you get caught in the lie, or you get caught cheating in business or in a relationship, you lose 50% of the equity of that relationship forever. Forever. And so it would be better if you cheated on your wife to get up in the morning, get out of bed, and call her up and say, I just cheated on you. I just know that I made a huge mistake. It, it will alter the relationship, but at least she'll trust that you told her the truth. You are weak in that moment. People never do that and they destroy their relationships. In business, it's worse. Once you lose trust with somebody, once you do something that was dishonest with them, 
Word gets out real fast, and you can never get it back. What is the... Give him a big hand for being here, by the way, okay? Thank you. He could be doing other things today. Two more questions. Sure. Number one, why did you agree... Why did you agree to do this? Like, why do you do things like this? Do you like this? Does I, I really, I, I think there comes a point, uh, and I'm, you know, I'm very fortunate. I don't need any more money. I, I need to keep what I've got because I use it for all kinds of different purposes, including investing in companies all the time. But I really enjoy giving back. I, I like to share my experiences. You may not agree with them. You may not agree with some of these things, but it's food for thought. That's why I spend more and more time guest lecturing because. I know things that these kids don't know, and I want them to be successful. I'm all about entrepreneurship. I'm always trying to get entrepreneurs to be successful, because the backbone of the American life is the entrepreneur that takes risks and builds businesses and creates jobs, and I want to be part of that. That's, that's why I, I fight so much against waste in government, but that's a different story. Yeah. You know, it's sort of, this is a time now to recover from this pandemic, and kick ass again, and I think this country is going to come out of this thing on fire. It's going to be fantastic. What is the term? What does the term 10x mean to you? 10x? 10x. It's an accelerator. It doesn't mean money to me. It means you're going to be 10 times better at whatever you're doing. That's what I ask people to do. I say, what can you do to accelerate? What can you do to be better at what you do? People that can perform, that have consistency of performance, are all 10Xers. And I'll tell you a practical reason. Think about it in sales. If I can find, and these days I hire a lot of women because they're fantastic salespeople. And the reason I love them for what they do is they actually hit their targets. They hit their targets. And why that matters to me is if I know they're going to bring two million that quarter, I can allocate the capital properly. So a salesperson that can actually deliver consistently is worth gold. Because you're allocating it's worth your capital. Bitcoin. Yeah, it's worth whatever. You know, I, I'll, I'll pay my employees in Bitcoin if they want it. That's fine with me. But it's sort of a really interesting dynamic to talk about consistency. 10x means you're a performer and you're growing and becoming better and you're enhancing your productivity. That's what it means to me. Well, you're a 10xer, okay? Thank you. You're Thank a great, you. great example of success in the American appreciate dream. It. Really appreciate you. Ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Kevin O'Leary, give him a big hand. 10x. Thank you very much. Come on.